Good afternoon. My name is Maxine Schreier. I am a professor at Boston College, and I direct the project on Russian and Eurasian Jewry here at the Davis Center at Harvard. And I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's panel on David Oistrich. I also want to tell you that uh, our project is supported by a generous grant from Genesis Philanthropy Group. And we also have support from the Center for Jewish Studies here in Harvard. And uh, of course, the Davis Center and its staff uh, uh, are what makes uh, all of this possible. And I want to thank all my colleagues there. And especially, I want to recognize Maria Altamora, our Director of, Admis of Administration, who's really been putting up with a lot of my follies this year. And this is one of them. Because uh, uh, I really feel strongly that we should be going beyond history and uh, literature. And uh, this uh, whole uh, year, we are calling the series Great Russian Jews uh, Who Shaped the World. Uh, some of you were at our two panels uh, in the fall. We had the wonderful event on Golden Meir with uh, Nina Lahav and Sam Casso. And then we had uh, an equally wonderful panel on Vasily Grossman. And we had Alexandra Popov and Boris Lanyan. So this is our third panel. And then in April, uh, we are going to have a panel on Simeon Batvinik, the mm. great uh, Jewish uh, Soviet chess uh, player. And uh, we are bringing Emil Sutovsky, uh, the uh, Russian-Israeli grandmaster, and uh, John Donaldson, Donaldson, the great American chess player, and also Bobby Fischer's biographer. So without further ado, welcome. This afternoon, we are celebrating the life and legacy of David Oistrich, violin virtuoso, interpreter of modern Russian and Soviet composers, teacher, visionary, and Soviet cultural ambassador. And uh, we're privileged to have with us two remarkable individuals whom um, I'm very happy to welcome here and uh, will introduce. Uh, sitting on my left is uh, Harlow Robinson, who's an author, lecturer, and Matthews Distinguished University Professor Emeritus of History at Northeastern University. He is uh, the author of many books. Uh, they include Russians in Hollywood, Hollywood's Russians, uh, Sergei Prokofiev, A Biography, Selected Letters of Sergei Prokofiev, and The Last Impresario, The Lifetimes and Legacy of Saul Hurok. Harlow's articles, essays, and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, Boston Globe, Los Angeles Times, uh, and uh, as uh, a longtime resident of Boston, and as a longtime resident of Boston, I'm sure you uh, have come to appreciate Harlow's many contributions to Boston's musical life uh, as an annotator of many programs for the BSO. But he's also appeared uh, as a commentator and lecturer, not only at the BSO, but also at the Lincoln Center, New York Philharmonic, San Francisco Symphony, Aspen Music Festival, Carnegie Hall, Rotterdam Philharmonic, and other venues, uh, as well as contribute commentary to the NPR, WGBH, and uh, the Metropolitan Opera Saturday matinee broadcasts. Uh, Professor Robinson is the recipient of numerous grants and fellowships that include the American Council of Learned Societies uh, and the Whiting. And in 2010, he was named an Academy Film Scholar by the Academy of Motion Pictures, uh, Arts, and Sciences for a biography of uh, director Lewis Milestone. And I understand this book is about to come out. In welcome. Book. Welcome, Harlow. Thank you. And uh, I'm Thank also you. very happy to welcome Alek Krysa, the distinguished Ukrainian-American violinist who was long esteemed in the former USSR as a distinguished soloist, chamber musician, and teacher. And uh, as uh, you can see, <laughs> he's not uh, just a great musician, but uh, very much a product of Oysters. Legacy, uh, a student, a disciple of uh, David Oistrich, uh, Alek Krysa won major prizes in such international competitions as the Vinyavsky, Tchaikovsky, and Montreal competitions, and was outright winner of the Paganini competition. He began his teaching career as chairman of the violin department at uh, Kiev University, and in 1975-1988 was professor of violin at the Moscow Conservatory. 
He's currently professor of violin at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. He's performed in major music centers throughout the world with leading orchestras, conductors, and ensembles. Uh, in addition to his solo career, Mr. Krasa was leader of the Kiev Conservatory String Quartet, the Leontovy String Quartet, and the Beethoven String Quartet. And I was just telling Alech that uh, uh, my family were friends of the late uh, great uh, uh, cellist uh, Evgeny Altman. And uh, I just want to take this moment to remember him fondly. He was one of the leading uh, performers in the Beethoven Quartet. Uh, and uh, Alec has recorded with numerous uh, labels, including Melodia, Triton, Olympia, Amadis, Polsky, Nagrani, TNC, and Russian disc labels, uh, as well as served on the jury panel of the international Tchaikovsky, uh, Vinyavsky, Paganini, Chrysler, Oyster, Lipitzer, Sarasate, Bach, Spohr, Joachim, and other violin competitions. Welcome, Alek Krasa. Thank you. It's wonderful, wonderful to have you. And uh, since uh, we are here to remember and uh, to uh, discuss uh, the legacy of uh, the great uh, violinist David Oyster, I'd like to begin by playing a little clip. Uh, and uh, this is uh, from uh, uh, the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. This uh, recording is uh, from Berlin, 1963. Gennady Rajdiestinsky is conducting. There's going to be a tiny technical interlude because we have to get this uh, running. But we're going to play the very beginning of this recording. What is the legacy of uh, David Oyster? Uh, Alec, let's start with you. Well, I think uh, the art of David Oyster and his playing, to me, is like very simple beauty and perfection. 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 So I can compare his art to probably. Mozart in music, and Raphael in music. And uh, 
his legacy as a, as a uh, uh, performer and uh, teacher and other things, it's uh, hard to believe that one man can do that within one life. And uh, of course, it was a big privilege to be seven years with him. I discovered what is that uh, violin playing, the top violin playing. And uh, I am trying to give my students his advisor and his approach. Of course, I am not always trust him, <laughs> but I am trying to keep very strongly. And I can also say that without Oistrach, I will different performer, different violinist, and also different person. That very briefly. Thank you. That's <laughs> wonderful. Harlow, turning to you with the same question. Yes, well, you know, um, I came to Oistrach actually from two different directions, uh, the beginning and the end of his career, um, because when I was writing my biography of, of Prokofiev, of course, uh, Oistrach and Prokofiev went way back. In fact, uh, well, Prokofiev met Oistrak on his very first trip back to the Soviet Union from Paris in 1927. That's another story we can tell a little bit more. And we about will. Later. I hope <laughs> right. So. And it was Oistrak who played uh, the uh, two movements of the first sonata of Prokofiev, violin sonata, at Prokofiev's funeral, which, as many of you know, was the same, he died the same day as Stalin. And so his funeral was a rather restrained affair. But Oistrak was there and played uh, the first and third movement of the first uh, violin sonata, which was written with Oistrak's um, help. It was really Oistrak and Prokofiev who worked together so closely in the 40s. And then at the end of his career, of course, Oistrak, and I remember this growing up during the Cold War, um, Oistrak uh, was one of the first uh, to come to America as a Soviet um, musician, 1955. Uh, only Emil Gilles came before him. And if this was even before the Moiseev and the Bolshoi and the Kirov, all of which were brought by uh, Solomon Yurok. Uh, not the first visit of Oistrak, but all the subsequent ones were arranged by Solomon Yurok, the great impresario. And I wrote a book about Yurok, and they became very close friends. Um, so it was sort of the beginning and the end. And in both those cases, what an enormous influence he had. And as you say, Oleg, of course, he was, um, his personality is also something that was very important. But his relationship to leading Soviet composers of his time was in very influential, both especially with Shostakovich, with Prokofiev, and Khachaturian, and actually many others. And I think uh, Prokofiev probably would never have written uh, those two sonatas for violin if not for, for Oistrakh because it was Oistrak who, who wanted him to write sonata number one and who persuaded him to remake his flute sonata into a violin sonata yeah. uh, n n number two. Uh, and of course, Oistrak gave the premieres of Shostakovich's two violin concerti, uh, was very involved with Shostakovich. And I think in understanding Oistrak and his place in Soviet musical history and how he survived also, which is an interesting question I think we should t touch upon, uh, you know, he was almost exactly the same age as Shostakovich. They grew up uh, very much in the same period. Uh, Oistrak born in 1908, Shostakovich in 1906. And they both remained in the Soviet Union. They never emigrated, although there were certainly opportunities to do so. Uh, they were very committed to Soviet music. Uh, they also had to make certain compromises, which we can talk about, uh, just to survive in the Soviet system. But as a important interpreter, and uh, stimulus to these composers. I think if he had done nothing else, uh, we'd remember him. Uh, but his, his very close relationship to the, the important composers of his time. And you know, both of them, Oistrakh and Shostakovich, they kind of grew up with Soviet music yeah, yeah. Uh, together. Anything else? Uh, because I, I would like us sort of to go back a bit to his beginnings. But uh, Alek, I, I remember you said you had some story about this recording that we played. Uh, yeah, Tchaikovsky, of course, uh, every violinist like uh, <coughs> Tchaikovsky. So I have several funny cases. Yeah. <laughs> First, when I, you know, because uh, every lesson uh, with Oyster, it was open for, to the public. 
and you never know uh, uh, who can come. So very often, you know, Karajan, <laughs> Shostakovich, and once I played uh, Tchaikovsky concerto, Isaac Stern came. Dodik, Isaac, how are you? Da, 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 da. Young man, continue, Isaac Stern. Yeah. And I was so nervous. I started to play, everything is shaking. And uh, the, the fragment finished, and, I, and he, he approached me and said, young man, why are you so unhappy? I said, I am not unhappy, I'm scared. <laughs> so, etc., uh, etc. Et now, uh, another story, but totally different. Uh, in U.S., probably uh, Oyster was never uh, recognized as a conductor, but he was excellent conductor. And uh, he but in Amsterdam, he was conducting yeah the whole Brahms cycle. The whole yeah. cycle. He, yeah. uh, of course, uh, was yeah. a soloist in it, but I think yeah. he conducted at least three three of the performances. I don't remember, yeah. but the whole Brahms yeah. for, for symphony. Right. And, That's uh, and the so last mm -hmm. si yeah. series that he. And of course, uh, every ma major orchestra invited him. Of course, just to play for Oyster, everyone played his best. But the concertmaster of the Berlin Philharmonic told me that uh, Schubert, a major symphony, was the best in his life with David Oyster. Mm -hmm. And I played with him Tchaikovsky concerto. And again, you know, the Oyster, I'm here. So it was terrible, terrible <laughs> situation. He understood that I'm very nervous. You just conducted, and it's, it's so, so comfortable. Everything like you're playing with piano. Yeah. And uh, after cadenza, before cadenza, it's a long trill, and I'm finished with the trill, and he understands that I'm really very nervous. So he has to conduct the entry of the orchestra. He turns slowly, and it's my leg like that. Continue, continue. <laughs> so I will never forget that event. Etc. So, if we, we, we can go to Prokofiev. Oh. Perhaps before we do that, let's talk a little bit about Odessa yeah, and okay. his beginnings. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps one way of segueing into this is to say that uh, so, Oyster was born in 1908. Uh, if you remember Babel's story, Probuzhdenie, the awakening, the story is about. A Jewish boy in Odessa, right, whose father has the ambition for him to become uh, a great violinist after the fashion of other Jewish uh, Russian violinists, because this was very much one of the paths uh, that was seen as a great opportunity. Thinking of uh, uh, Misha Ehrman, of uh, Zimbalist, uh, other great violinists. And of course, in the story, the boy has no interest in playing the violin. But what is important is. He's studying with a renowned Odessan violin teacher, who in the story is disguised as Zagursky. In fact, he's based on Stalyarsky, yes. who himself was a student of Leopold Auer and who was Oystrakh's own student. Of course, Oystrakh was uh, very committed and he had talent, unlike uh, Weber's uh, own autobiographical Jewish boy in the story. But, um, I wonder if we could uh, talk a bit about uh, the early Soviet, early Odessan musical scene after the revolution. Because, of course, the, some of the greatest violinists had emigrated. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what was his competition in his mm, early years? Well, you know, I, I think it was Isaac Stern told me once um, that what was cultural exchange of, of violinists, it was we send them our Jewish violinists from Odessa, and they send us their vi Jewish violinists from Odessa. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, certainly this was an amazing tradition of violin, but also of all kinds of music. The opera house, uh, opera was very well known. And I think you know what's so interesting to me about Oystrakh um, is that he did appear during a period when Soviet music was very much in flux. Uh, it is very early education he received from his parents, I guess you could say, but most of it was financed by the state after, after the Russian Revolution. And he really represented this whole new generation. You're absolutely right, of course, it was huge emigration, uh, um, both then and later on. 
of many of the most important musicians. And of course, think about you know, Stravinsky, Rachmaninoff, Prokofiev, they were all leaving. Um, and Metner and so many others. And, but he was young, like Shostakovich. <laughs> he was only, what, 10 years old at the time of the Russian Revolution. So this was not something he was going to be doing then. So he was really created by this new Soviet system. And by this, I think competitions you know, were so important, especially during the Stalin years. Stalin loved competitions of all kinds. And he loved for Soviet, um, anybody who was entered in a competition abroad to win. And uh, of course, that's what uh, Oystrak did very early on. That's uh, right. At yes. the Vinyavsky competition, uh, yeah. And the Queen Elizabeth. And the Queen Elizabeth. That's right. So he was a, a competition, uh, he was a competition winner which yeah. really uh, helped him in the eyes of Stalin, I think. And his students were also competition winners. Vinyavsky so, is 1935, uh, so right. he is uh, already a very, very yeah. accomplished violinist. Right. But that's a real meteoric, me meteoric rise, right? Uh, yeah. And maybe this would be also a good place to talk a bit more about the, what could we so call it, the Soviet uh, sh violin school and what it meant. Well, I can simply say that uh, with all terrible things with Soviet regime. Our uh, education in Soviet Union was fantastic. And uh, especially, uh, we are talking about Moscow Conservatory, St. Petersburg Conservatory, Kiev Conservatory. Uh, they, they, there were so many, sometimes, a long time, several years, concert series Soviet Union was made with students from conservatory because they were winner of winners of uh, many international competitions. And uh, we had just a privilege if, if you won first prize or major prize. So you, 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 you can get concert tour and uh, of course concert tour abroad, which for us was like Rostropovich said to, to, to go abroad. It's, it's the same how you have to fly to Scorpion versus <laughs> to the moon <laughs> the yeah, or Mars. <laughs> yes, yeah. right. Yeah. And uh, uh, be, be, and before the, the international competition, we had very very strong national competition. Mm -hmm. So they choose uh, participants, and uh, we were free from any any classes. Uh, uh, we had the possibility to, to play. Uh, concertos you know, with orchestra for free, yeah. So it really helped young people. So by 1937, Oysterk is already a professor at Moscow Conservatory. Yeah. I just want to try and tease some sense out of this. Of course, in the West, he is still broadly known as uh, a great performer of Tchaikovsky, Brahms, and Beethoven. Uh, I wonder if we could talk rather about his role as a performer, champion, and interpreter of uh, Soviet composers. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's interesting, you know, that um, he, even in the mid-1930s, uh, there was a new apartment building built uh, on the on Sadovia Kaltsoya, uh, actually, here, we have Chikalava, here it is. Uh, and uh, it was for uh, cultural elite figures. Uh, and this is where Prokofiev moved in when he came from Paris in 1936. One of the promises you know, that uh, Stalin was given to Prokofiev, oh, I'm going to give you a wonderful new apartment. <laughs> and he, he was given an apartment in this building. And this is also where Oystrak lived. Uh, so they were actually neighbors. And uh, um, also Nehaus lived in this building and many other very prominent musicians. So already by the mid-30s, he, he had that kind of status. And so he was um, you know, rubbing shoulders with these people. Prokofiev never actually taught, but they saw each other a lot in other contexts, and they played chess together. This is another whole aspect of the prokofiev oystrak relationship that's so interesting. They used to play chess a lot. Um, so yes, he met Prokofiev. He loved Prokofiev's music. And this is also at a time, remember, when Prokofiev's music was regarded with a certain degree of uh, suspicion. Uh, he was sort of uh, under a political cloud because he spent all those years in Paris. Uh, and uh, Oystrak very enthusiastically embraced Prokofiev, which was very important for him, I think, at that yeah, time. You know, uh, the concerto number one was prohibited. Right, <laughs> right, right. 
Right. And yet, of course, uh, well, not so much of course, but uh, as a rhetorical transition, he weathers, Oistrakh weathers uh, all the storms uh, very, very successfully. And uh, the, 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 it's not necessarily surprising in the pre-war period, uh, but once we get into the post-war years and the darker years for Soviet Jewry, this is something that calls for a, a discussion. But um, I just want to draw your attention to this uh, slide. Uh, it's a tremendously important photograph in the history of uh, Soviet culture and uh, in Jewish history. So uh, this is uh, August uh, 1941. Uh, this is the famous appeal by a group of uh, prominent Soviet Jews uh, from a very broad spectrum of uh, professions and fields to world Jewry. Some of the people in these photographs would soon form the core of the uh, um, Soviet anti of Jewish the Jewish anti-fascist committee, specifically uh, the bottom uh, right. That's Ilya Ehrenborg. The person standing over the microphone is uh, Salomon Mikhoels. So in the leftmost uh, side is Marshak, and there in the second row, second from the left, that's Oistrakh. Uh, you see, so he figures very prominently in this group. Uh, as of course, Mikhoels was later. Right. Murdered. Yeah. So, um, well, the question of uh, how he weathers uh, yes. the storms, uh, I think, well, you know, is not one we should yeah. avoid. No, uh, and I think, you know, it's interesting. If you've read uh, the uh, biography of uh, Galina Vishnevskaya, uh, who also knew Oistrak very well, um, and she, she talks about um, having a conversation with Oistrak uh, later on, at the time that uh, Rostropovich and Vyshinska had taken in Solzhenitsyn, right. which was a very dangerous thing to do and, of course, changed their lives. And um, what he said to her was this, I won't play the hypocrite with you. I never would have taken him in. <laughs> to, tell, to tell the truth, I'm afraid. My wife and I lived through 37 when night after night every person in Moscow feared his arrest. In our building, Ulitsich Kalava, only our apartment and the one facing it on the same floor survived the arrests. All the other tenants had been taken off God knows where. Every night I expected the worst. I set aside some warm underwear and a bit of food for the inevitable moment. You can't imagine what we went through, listening for a fatal knock on the door or the sound of a car pulling up. One night a black Mariah stopped out in front. Who were they coming for, us or the neighbors? The downstairs door slammed and the elevator began its ascent. Finally it stopped on our floor. We listened to the footsteps and went numb. Whose door would they come to? An eternity passed. Then we heard them ring at the apartment across from us since that moment. I have known I'm no fighter. Right. So um, in the particularly the post-war darker years for Soviet Jewry, um, Oyster remains uh, very much one of the gods of Soviet culture. I don't think he shuns his Jewishness, but I also don't think he promotes it very actively. And so I was wondering, Aliak, if you could talk to us perhaps from a personal perspective. What was uh, sort of his Jewishness like in the way you got to know him? You mean especially Jewish? Yeah, and sort of whether he uh, had anything to say to people he trusted uh, and uh, about questions of identity and identity politics, about anti-Semitism. I remember you and I, when we started exploring this yeah. panel, we touched on the question yeah. of uh, Ukrainian culture and uh, it being under attack, uh, yeah. and uh, something very interesting that he said to you about that. You know, we didn't talk to specifically about that aspect, but uh, of course, how to say it, <laughs> he understood that uh, his, his blood and his performance, uh, he's proud to, 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 to spend around the world as a, as, a, as a Jew. Another thing that he understands that uh, he is also the performer for the Soviet Union. So it was not, it's a little bit dangerous, you know, I'm Jewish or whatever. And uh, remember that Piata Agrafa in mm -hmm. passport, mm -hmm. number five, mm -hmm. nationality, Jew. Mm -hmm. So, it always was pressure, and, and I remember in conservatory, but nobody 
talk that openly, but Mr. Krisa, you know, we have limit. We are not against, but just be careful. <laughs> so it was like that. But he was, I think he was first who came to Israel as a, a Jew, uh, Soviet performer. Is it correct? I, I actually that. do not know. Yeah. I was hoping. No, yeah, I don't one know. Of you but he, it is true that he refused to sign the letter. Well, there were uh, cultural which was very exchanges important. until 1967. Yeah. No, 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 in 67, at the Six Day War. No, no diplomatic in relations. Yeah. Well, no. there was a period when they were, yeah. and they and were I broken, he, and he, they were permanently broken in 1967. Right. So I remember this very well. And I again, was born during the Six Day uh, War. You know, right. uh, the, the Jewish uh, performers or Jewish artists never were Jewish, Soviet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you right. know, by the way, he said a very curious thing to the American journalist Israel Schenker, who tried to speak to him in Yiddish. And he said, I prefer to speak German, but when I speak German, I think in Yiddish, or something <laughs> of that sort, which was a very roundabout way of uh, answering the question that yeah. we're pondering <laughs> here today. Yeah, well, in any case, sort but of. I, I do think it's worth pointing out that in 67, the Six Day War, when there was uh, uh, the very bad relations with Israel, he did refuse to sign this document that many prominent cultural figures were asked to sign uh, to uh, um, condemning Israel. So it was uh, not maybe a very bold step, but still. Absolutely. He did that. And of course, we all know, I think uh, many of us are historians of Russia, that after all, the Jews supported uh, Bolshevism uh, in, in, in many ways from the beginning, and Odessa was kind of a center of that. Um, so I don't think it's so surprising. And yes, you're right, I think it was a balancing act that he had to make his entire life. And interesting to compare him with somebody like uh, the composer Weinberg, uh, who of course was married to Solomon That's Michael's right. daughter. Yeah. and then ended up in prison. It was Shostakovich who helped get him out. Uh, so he, he never ended up in that kind of a situation, maybe because he didn't have such a prominent wife, but, um, or, although she was an important uh, musician in her own right. But um, yes, you're right. He, oh, and one, I just want to add one of the uh, great ironies, I think, of Oistrov's career, especially at the end when he came to America, is that he was represented, as I said, by S. Hirok Presents. Of course, Hirok was himself uh, uh, Jewish and supported Jewish causes uh, very strongly. And then at the very end, maybe some of you remember this, you know, the Jewish Defense League started to uh, picket and even attack performances by Hirox artists from the Soviet Union because this was during the period when the JDL was saying that uh, he was cozying up to the Soviet Union, which was mistreating its Jews. And in fact, at an Oistrak uh, concert, there was a demonstration. This was uh, in 1969 in at Carnegie Hall. Yeah, and then just a couple of years later, they actually, the JDL actually bombed Hirok's offices, and uh, his receptionist was killed. Well, I can uh, tell you so, this, uh, and uh, uh, I don't want to be doing most of the talking, but as a personal note, uh, I remember well that when we started going to Perno, Estonia on vacation in 1971. Uh, this was a resort in Estonia which was favored by uh, Soviet intellectual artistic right. intelligentsia and had a very, very, very strong Jewish following. Mm -hmm. So Oistrakh rented a house there in a very prestigious part of town, not far from the former casino. And he was regarded by Jewish kids and their Jewish parents as really kind of demigod. But what was interesting, I remember sort of the parents were saying, this is uh, the icon of Jewish Soviet success. But at the very same time, the Soviet Jewish immigration was on the rise. So in a sense, he represented this tension. He was the kind of success that most Jews in Soviet Union could never attain. So of course, as you can imagine, he is being the, one of the Soviet cultural ambassadors was, I think, deeply and multiply ironic. Absolutely. But of course, it was easier to be a violinist than a composer, I think. Yes. <laughs> uh, because you were interpreting other people's works and not creating them, which was more, much more dangerous, right? Uh, yeah. But you're absolutely right. I mean, when you think about the people around, Meyerhold, uh, arrested in 1939. Uh, and yeah, it is. 
somehow he was able, I think he was a very um, valuable cultural asset, yeah. of course, yeah. abroad, especially later on, but really throughout his life. Yeah. So, well, yeah. I wonder if we could uh, turn a bit more to the question of uh, Oyster as a teacher. And uh, we have some wonderful photographs uh, that uh, Alec provided from his personal papers. Uh, and uh, I wonder if you could uh, talk to us more about Oyster as a teacher and how he taught, how he trained musicians. Uh, I start with the um, uh, first meeting with Oyster was in Kiev. Uh, it was national Ukrainian uh, competition and I won second prize. And it was a concert of uh, prize winners of that competition. And Oystrach was in Kiev, and I was in Kiev. And uh, his former student, Professor Olga Parhomenko, convinced him that, David Fyodorovich, you have to listen to this. He said, well, any, any city, everyone is telling me that I have to listen to that talented boy or girl. But so it, it happened. And it was after his rehearsal in Green Room. And they, he came from stage sitting, a young man. Your name? I says, yes, I says, you may start. And it was piano, big concert piano. I walk, as I stood behind the piano. He was smiling. I said, young man, you're always playing like that? I said, no, only today. <laughs> so it was a successful meeting. He said, you can come to our studio, my studio. And uh, as a teacher, he was, first of all, he, he, he played any piece, any time, with absolute perfection. So it was sometimes very Depressed, depressed, intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, it helped because, well, it's so easy, it's so natural, and so beautiful. So maybe I can do the same thing. Uh, of course, he had very good students. Uh, he never talked about how to play staccato, detaché, or whatever. So it was done before. But uh, artistically, he, he just opened the world. Yeah. And uh, uh, repertoire, he was so accurate to any, any student. And uh, as you remember, his uh, studio fam famous uh, uh, artist, very different. Everyone is different. But you, you can immediately recognize that he is a student of David Oyster. That singing technique, absolute high class taste and uh, uh, the broad repertoire and also that moment that he was a uh, famous uh, chamber music player. He had fan fantastic trio of Boris So uh, that helped also not to be you know, focused on Paganini caprices or such, a much broader repertoire. So all that together and history of any piece or, or you know, personal contact with such a great composer helped a lot. And every, as I said, every lesson, it was a concert because it, it, you, you always his studio was full of people. Yeah. So it was so important every lesson and he, 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 he concertized a lot, sometimes for a long time. So every lesson was so valuable that I remember almost everything that what he said and when he said and the, the piece that they played big, big because it was no, no, unforgettable. Yeah. And he was <coughs> very polite. He started, doesn't matter how you, you played, but he, he was trying to find something positive. Later on, he <laughs> increased that, <laughs> but it was always so. So he created that atmosphere of, you know, kindness. Yeah. We can talk very long time. So, but it was most important thing. Yeah. 
Wonderful. It, it, it is, um, of course, you studied with him, but when I listened to a lot of interviews with those who studied with him, they all said how he would let them play through the piece always, not yeah. interrupt them. Sort of By giving the way, them uh, some confidence. We talked and then he would start with the criticism. We talked about yeah. Prokofiev. Sometimes he was uh, just strict. I, once I came with Sonata by Prokofiev number one, not very well prepared. You know, when you're 20, you're not only practicing. So, and uh, I understood that it was very bad. And uh, in Moscow Conservatory, we had two big jury and during the semester, small jury. So it was one, next week was uh, uh, small jury. And he said, well, Oleg, you, sh sh you should play this sonata next week, the jury. And pianist, pianist said, David Fyodor, he's not absolutely right. It's, it's absolutely unprepared, so, so he can't do it. And Oyster slowly said, if he is talented, he can do it. If not, what can I do? So I disappeared for <laughs> this entire week. Now I can pick up violin and play Prokofiev number one. So that the teacher. So is this a good <laughs> moment to play a clip from uh, the Prokofiev? Yes. Uh, so this is actually a famous recording. This is uh, Oystrak playing Prokofiev's violin. Not the first one in F minor, and uh, what is also important is Sudaslav Richter is at the piano. Right. Uh, Oyster, and then, you know, it's worth pointing out the amazing constellation of musicians in the Soviet Union at the end of the 40s. Richter, Rostropovich, Prokofiev, Shostakovich, yes. Oystrakh, Aborian. And they had this amazing, you know, despite the extremely yeah. difficult yeah. conditions in which they were living, yeah. they had this amazing community and uh, you know, relied upon each other and fed off each other in, in, in an incredibly positive way. And you know, I want to stress, you know, for Prokofiev, I think Oystrak was almost a lifesaver. You know, I mean, yeah. he sort of appeared in his life when he, he was separated from his wife, his personal life was in turmoil, he was under political pressure almost constantly, um, and Oystrak, uh, as this young, and he and Rostropovich both sort of came to his uh, aid. And this is, you know, this piece, it's not at all a, a work of typical Soviet music. It's very, it's, it's very dark. It's very, <laughs> very dark. Uh, it um, clearly refers to Bach, you know. And um, actually, it was Prokofiev who told Richter, and this is a good way to introduce it, that the wonderful scales in the first movement that keep going up and down, and they come back at the very end of the piece. He said they should sound like wind in a graveyard. Yeah. Cemetery. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll play a bit of that. So this is uh, from uh, the Grand Hall of uh, the Moscow Conservatory. And uh, I love this recording because they don't start for two minutes. <laughs> Literally. The, it's the slowest, slowest opening. So let me see if we can get this yeah. to work uh, without uh, any, without any, yes. So uh, I'm going to skip a little bit because literally for a minute, not much happens. Thank <laughs> you. 
wonderful recordings. Yes. yes. And they worked, they worked on this piece actually out at um, Prokofiev's Dacha at uh, Nikolina Gara and also on the, the second sonata. Right, and you know, no, uh, this was during the war. This was 1944. And another interesting uh, fact about when well, they worked on it. Not yes, it was, um, this recording yeah. is, I think, about what 69. Uh, what 63. was it? Three. Se oh, this is 72. Oh, so this 72. is actually quite okay. late. 72 because yeah. he started with Richter much later right. after after Oborin. Right. Yeah. But you know, he stayed. Oistrakh stayed in Moscow during the war. You know, uh, Prokofiev was evacuated. Shostakovich was evacuated. Many others were evacuated, but he chose to stay uh, uh, in, in Moscow during there the There are Nobel legends Nobel. that yeah. he it, it, it one f phenomenal recording. Uh, so, so Soviet government tried to convince the, the world that still alive and the musicians still alive and still concert going on. So radio asked him to play something very short, three, four minutes. And he chose Caprice by Paganini, number 17. It was terrible winter, and something happened with his car. So he literally came s several seconds before life, you know, transmission. And he played that, and fortunately it was recorded. I had that, I have that recording. And when I presented that recording to my colleagues at Eastman School of Music, was shock. They s said very simply, we didn't know that it's possible to play violin like that. But after, you know, 20 s minus Celsius, he took, could pick up a violin and then play. And he went to Leningrad also? That's and right. And played, there, yeah. played there? There are mm -hmm. apparently unconfirmed yeah. legends that Place Leningrad. here in Stalingrad yeah, yeah. in late 1942. Right. I haven't been able to find. But I also have found <laughs> yeah. no proof I know because you, others, you know, others have him perform at different places at the same time. But he toured the war fronts and he played uh, throughout the war. No, no, I think uh, I told you already that I, uh, there is a book. He wrote every every concert, small, big one. So he. he there was not any evidence of right. Stalingrad. Stalingrad. Well, I think it's but a legend. But he was very uh, punctual. So it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's yeah. And in answering the question, I, you know, how did he survive? I think you know that certainly, uh, you know, what his conduct during the war was very important in sort of establishing himself as a patriot. And I don't know. He seemed to have this natural sense of how far he could go. No, uh, but I, I think, yeah. Harlow, the point you made before is a super valid one. That a Jewish interpreter of Soviet culture mm -hmm. is in a different, perhaps yes. less vulnerable yes. position than a Jewish a producer and yes. creator. Right. I think it's a tremendously valuable point. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also think this is uh, relevant during his latter years uh, with the rise of the Jewish-Soviet immigration. Because, of course, uh, whether he liked it or not, he was serving as a kind of antidote, public antidote. Yes. Well, actually, if you want to read some interesting reminiscences of Oistrakh, read uh, Na the book uh, Nathan Milstein's uh, memoirs, uh, which he did with Solomon Volkov. That's right. Uh, and he and they were together in Odessa as children. Yeah. And then, of course, Milstein came to America and had a very successful career here. But when Oistrakh would come to America, um, he would often see Milstein. And Milstein has some very funny stories about meeting him and also about you know, the kind of constraints he was under as a Soviet artist being here. He, could o he was given only a tiny fraction of the fees that he was earning, of course. Most of the money was going to Goss Concert. Um, and uh, he, he tells a story about how once they were in Vienna together and they went to a restaurant and Oistrakh uh, ordered a steak and the steak came and it was really too raw. And uh, he said, uh, but Milstein said, well, why don't you send it back? And Oyster said, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we take what we're given. Uh, and he sort of uses this in a, as an example. But he gave uh, much more. <laughs> yes, right. So, and, and, I, and Natalia Gutmann, in a, in a very good interview, was saying how Oistrakh lived, even though he had, was in that building, he had a small apartment. He never was asking for a big apartment. Yeah. He didn't really he care very about loyal to luxury, to uh, to it seems, truly. Yeah, yeah right. So uh, before we open uh, 
on the floor and uh, start entertaining questions. Aliak, uh, any final comments uh, about Toyster as a teacher, as uh, a performer? You know, maybe something about his kindness and warmth. Uh, one, because I saw the picture with Igor. Mm -hmm. Once I had a lesson. This one, right? No, no. Oistrach, uh, Oistrach, Igor Oistrach, and uh, I think Sol York. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I had a lesson with him, and I played Sonata by Brahms. And suddenly, Oistrach said, uh, Oleg, wait, wait a minute. And like crazy, started to play Shostakovich concerto. I have something wrong with my teacher. I didn't say anything. And he saw that I was, <laughs> he said, Oleg, I'm fine. Igor, first time playing Shostakovich concerto somewhere, and I'm trying to help him. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very nice. <laughs> it's yeah. wonderful. It's wonderful. This was so enjoyable. I want to thank you both. But please don't go away. We have. Uh, uh, I'm sure some questions and comments, but I, I also want to say that we're privileged to have in the audience uh, another very famous uh, disciple of David Oyster, our own Yuri Mazurkevich, uh, professor of, at Boston University and a distinguished uh, performer who is here with us. And I would like to invite him to share some comments, uh, if you don't mind, Yuri. And there's, there's a microphone there if you need one or you don't have to. Great to see my old friend Yuri. <laughs> <laughs>
died. Of course, we'll allow you. How, how can we not allow you? Let me uh, tell you the funny story. <coughs> As Oleg mentioned, uh, Oleg, uh, David Oyster constantly had great visitors from heaven. And uh, so uh, you already mentioned about uh, you know, uh, Isaac Stern and uh, Larry Young and so on and so on. But I remember one day, uh, Queen Elizabeth of Belgium was in Moscow. And Queen Elizabeth of Belgium liked Oyster immensely because he was like living in her palace when he was in, in Brussels. He was also playing there, warming up, and uh, apparently gave her some violin lessons. She was actually playing violin with it. So Queen of Elizabeth arrived to Moscow. And uh, of course, David Oyster said to his students, please, Stand up near our class when Queen Elizabeth come, uh, comes in. Uh, she uh, greet her and so on. And so we were standing, and uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth got stuck in elevator actually for almost half an hour between first and second. <laughs> You have to kiss. kiss. Yeah. That's what I did with Queen Elizabeth. I took her hand and I kissed her. And uh, immediately some advisor came to me and said, young man, you are not supposed to do so. You should take only her. But she was very kind. She smiled at me. She didn't say anything. But uh, I uh, understood that actually I made a big mistake. Protocol, uh, yeah. Diplomatic. That's great. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful for you to join us. And uh, we have some time for questions. So please, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate. Sergei. Say an excellent question. An, an interesting case is um, uh, Moise Weinberg, uh, who was, in fact, he has an amazing life story. In fact, the, the BSO played uh, a symphony, uh, no, his concerto, about a couple of seasons ago. And um, he was a Holocaust, he escaped from the Nazis in Poland and uh, was given a sanctuary in the USSR. And, and became a, a quite a well-known composer, very close friend of Shostakovich. He wrote the score for The Cranes the Are Flying. The Cranes Are Flying. Which is Yes, and that's big. sort of his commercial yeah. light side. Yeah. But his other music is very, um, very intellectual, very strong music. And he married the daughter of Solomon Michoels. Um, and uh, you know, he very much identified as a Jew. Uh, and uh, Shostakovich used to give him everything he wrote to have him look at it first. Um, and he was, um, he did fall, uh, did get in terrible trouble because, because, mainly because of his marriage. 
and after McHoyles, McHoyles was run down by the car in what, 49 or something like that. And then at the very end, uh, during the doctor's plot, uh, Weinberg was detained and put in prison uh, and Shostakovich actually helped to get him out. So there was one example. Now Oystrak, I think an important point to, in, in response to your question, he did not sign a denunciation of the composers who were attacked uh, in 1948. He refused to do that. So uh, that was certainly important. Um, yeah, maybe you can add more. No, no, yeah. that's fine. No, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think, and uh, as you know, I really stretch the limits of my expertise here, which is not musical culture. But uh, I, I think as a fair generalization, one could say that during the darkest years, of course, uh, musicians, particularly performers, suffered considerably less yes. than uh, composers. Uh, yeah, but of true. course, even less so than uh, um, members of the uh, literary profession and the theater profession. Uh, yes, yeah. well, you know, one yeah. thing though, once again, as I said earlier, Oystrak and Rostropovich, they uh, were very loyal to Prokofiev and Shostakovich during this period in the late 40s, when actually, literally, Prokofiev had no source of income. His uh, for, for, uh, compositions were not being played. He sort of had to retreat to his dacha. And uh, it was during that period that Rostropovich came to him and said, why don't you write me a cello sonata? And so they really supported him and Shostakovich. And I, a, a very good example of Shostakovich and Jewishness is his, the cycle that he wrote from Jewish yeah, folk poetry. Yeah. Uh, brilliant. In fact, the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center is currently doing a huge uh, Russian panorama festival of chamber music with four concerts. And they're going to be performing from Jewish folk poetry. And Shostakovich withheld that composition. Uh, he intentionally wrote it at the height of the anti-Jewish, uh, anti-Cosmopolitan campaign. Mm -hmm. But he withheld it from public performance until after Stalin's death. Uh, so it was sort of an act of private protest. And he, he did have a number of private performances at his apartment. Uh, but it was never publicly performed. Uh, so yeah. please. Yes. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in U.S. he was, I don't, I don't uh, uh, even in, if I ask them, have you seen a, as a conductor, nobody said yes. Nobody knows as a conductor. But uh, because he was a, a great musician, so sometimes he told me that violin, it's not enough for me. I need the ocean of music. Yeah. And uh, because you know, just to see Oystra on the, with, with Batuta, <laughs> you give all your arts, all your knowledge, everything. And uh, he was always uh, very successful with orchestra. Uh, first of all, he, he knew m music very well. He, he has his uh, um, set of uh, part. Uh, violin, cello, most, most of his fingering, his bowing. So it was perfectly preferred, prepared for first rehearsal. Every musician knew what to do, how to do, no, you know, uh, uh, spending time. As, uh, as the communication with conductor, first of all, Oyster or Jesminki, that they respected each other enormously. And Orostyshenko was famous as a, a, a companist. 
So I played with Rzeszemski too. You, 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 you don't have to uh, explain or ask something. He felt that we hold that, you know, <laughs> body was ready to follow you. So sometimes maybe specific moments you, you have to say something. But Rzeszemski knew Oistrach playing, I think, every note. So I think rehearsal would just play through because of two great musicians and respect. That's what I can say. You know, Oistrach recorded whole motor concertos, concerti uh, with the Berlin Philharmonic without conductor. Yeah, although he, he played with Karajan, uh, with Berlin Philharmonic, and so, so the orchestra prepar preferred him. He conducted and played. You know, it's also, we didn't mention, he also played the viola. That's right. <laughs> oh, oh, you know, viola yeah. always gets forgotten, yeah. right? Yeah. But uh, he also played viola and, and was a very uh, accomplished viola player. Unbelievable. He, yeah. he played viola like you, violin. <laughs> Nothing changed. It's the same perfection, same. So sometimes when his son played the uh, violin, he would play viola, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Please. Oh, uh, who, who was Luke after him? No, who were his? Who who were we, his? we sort of talked about his first great teacher, who was Talersky. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Talersky teaches the two, I think, four-year-old who were his heroes for non-violin players. Oh, very simple. Fritz Kreisler. Yeah, for him, he said it is the most aesthetical moment to hear violin playing was Chrysler. And uh, Chrysler was a member of the jury when he played on uh, Queen Elizabeth competition. And Chrysler, after de uh, his debut at Carnegie Hall, stood up first and applauded for, for David. First. Second was Isaac Stern <laughs> crying. <laughs> Please. Uh, I'm just curious. There was a question earlier about um, you know what he was like in lesson, and you know he was um, he worked together. Uh, he same time as Prokofiev Prokofiev. How much interpretive freedom did Oistrakh give you during your lesson, or did he insist on playing you know certain passages in Prokofiev a certain way because you know he knows the composer or was he really encouraging? Because it sounded like you know, he was a very nice person, but I wanted to know uh, whether he was, um, well, strict in some sense, especially artistically. He was not strict. But of course, we trust him. Anything that he said, it has to be like that. But uh, everyone is different. So even if any, any advice or uh, he played, we, 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 we couldn't copy playing like he did. So everyone has his own approach, not far from general, you know, way. He was absolutely angry, well, when he was bad taste. So that he, he didn't allow, never. Uh, uh, Technically, as I said, he never, he never <coughs> spent time with it because everyone was very well prepared. But stylistically, artistically, uh, it was, you know, we, we trust him like, like, like the, the god. Yeah. And uh, uh, because he played that so f perfectly and so beautifully, so we wanted to follow him, but some, you know, with personal uh, feeling. And um, even with my students, they said that you play differently than him, but, but so we allowed to do that in very elegant and very warm way. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank our distinguished guests 
Harlow Robinson and Yves Prisa for giving us the pleasure of this uh, performance of Remembering Weistrach. And uh, I think it should become a, an, an annual panel. Yes. Yeah, and There's I want to say thank you for being here, the famous yes. university. And I'm very grateful for organizer. Yes. And uh, I'm very happy to be among distinguished colleagues. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Maxime. Thank you. Thank you.